Okay, we're going to start the session, and uh, Bill and I are going to introduce our four panelists, uh, and we're not going to spend too much time because you want to hear from them, not from us. And Bill is going to tell you uh, the three questions that we're going to we ask each of the panelists to discuss. And uh, I'm always honored to be up on this. Well, well, you, well you, you do the questions first. No, let's introduce people first because then we'll ask them the questions. Why do you do it twice? But then why do it four times? We just do it all at once. They can just start talking. All right, all right. All right, come on. <laughs> all right, so we're going to be asking our panelists uh, three questions. So just so you know what they are. First question we're going to be, they're going to be answering is, could you tell us what are the top three things that have helped you to succeed with diabetes in your life or your career over the years? We're going to ask them the second question is, what advice would you give to a person who's been newly diagnosed with diabetes? And we also want them to, a uh, third point, talk about developments in treatment and technology, probably excluding what you just heard, but that have uh, meant to you uh, most over the years and what excite you, excites you most about the future. Hmm, that might be kind of easy. Um, okay, so that's what we're gonna be doing. And, um, you know, I think uh, all of us up here have type 1 except Bill, but I hope you guys know that Bill is really the only person that I know of that has received the honorary diabetes degree, which is a formal plaque. It's, it's for someone that does not have diabetes but knows what it's like to have diabetes. And we're obviously going to have to get uh, Steve one of those awards as well. Um, and I've had type 1 diabetes since 1970. Um, and, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from our panel words of wisdom. And I'm going to introduce Paula first. Paula has a little, uh, 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 going to have a moment of silent for us, and I'll let her explain that. But Paula, very briefly, you know, she has a long, impressive history. She developed diabetes when she was 29 in 1972. And at that time, you know, people weren't even talking about exercise as a regular um, you know, treatment for diabetes. It was pretty archaic back then. We had urine testing, no A1C, no home glucose monitoring, no CGM, no pumps, no insulin pens, at least in the States. And so it was pretty doggy dog out there. And uh, Paula, you know, through her career, she was a nurse, she was a mother of three children, uh, and also spent a lot of time starting uh, two organizations. The I'll make sure I get it right, the International Diabetes uh, Athletic Association and the Diabetes Exercise and Sports Association, which now sort of conglomerated with uh, uh, insulin dependence. And uh, I, I hope you don't mind me saying that Paula is 70 years old, I just learned last night, and still is a super active in everything she does. And I think it's really nice to see someone who has lived with diabetes successfully so long. So uh, Paula, thanks for being here. The moment of silence, if it's all right, Peter, um, I would like to ask for, our organization has a wonderful uh, group of people in Italy, and uh, a, a 39, 40-year-old Italian cyclist this summer, maybe some of you know of him, Mauro Tallini, I hope I'm saying his name right. <clears throat> His, his goal was going from Patagonia, the bottom of South America, and he was going to finish in Alaska. And he got, I don't know exactly how many kilometers he was able to get, but just before he got to San Diego, because insulin dependence was planning a welcome and all that, anyway, a terrible accident happened in a semi-truck. He was hit as he was cycling, and he was killed. And his, I want to say, whole life was dedicated to public awareness and to, to uh, exercise and diabetes. And he had done many solo trips as this one was being done also. And um, it was just a big blow, of course, to the Italian uh, other cyclists and the diabetes community. And we would like to honor him at least with just a moment of silence. And maybe when you go home, it's uh, T-A-L-I-N-I -I is his last name. You could look up because uh, he had a website and was, you know, excitedly talking about 
getting into the U.S. and going north and all of his adventures. So I just want, would like to ask for a, a little bit of honoring of this hardworking, dedicated person with diabetes. Thank you. I don't know about my words of wisdom. Uh, um, my heart has always been in diabetes and exercise, and uh, I'm, I guess my um, three things that have helped me, is that what you want me to talk about? Three things that have helped me in my diabetes career of uh, 41 years now have been, uh, first of all, my faith in God, second, a positive attitude, and uh, third, that exercise is a really important uh, daily uh, constant need for managing diabetes. Okay. Thanks, Paula. By the way, I, I should thank you. I, I remember going to my first International Diabetes Athletic Association meeting in 1988 or 9 or something like that. I think I'd been a diabetes psychologist for about a year. and I. I still remember it as one of the most inspiring things I've ever been to, so thanks. Um, so we're going to uh, just introduce um, one of our other panelists. I'm going to introduce Jerry Nairn, who I've just met. Um, Jerry's had uh, uh, type 1 diabetes since 1974 when he was 15. He was a high school sophomore on the cross-country team. Um, he's 54 now. Looking good, Jerry. Um, <laughs> he's an accomplished marathon and ultra-marathon runner. He's also a software engineer and a dad and a grandfather. He, he enjoys cycling and hiking and swimming, but running is the athletic activity he's done the most. He has only run over 60 marathon races or longer, only, wow, um, and hundreds of other races up to 50 miles. Wow. Um, so anyway, thanks for being here, Jerry, and please uh, chime in. Uh it's an honor to be here. Uh, the, this is a, a fantastic panel here. Um, but also just looking around the room and, and spending some time with a lot of the people that are here, I, um, I feel kind of out of place up here in front of you as if I had something to offer you. But um, I, I am really honored. And uh, I had thought about the... Uh, top three things that helped me uh, be successful with diabetes. Um, the first thing that happened was I was lucky, and I was lucky that I had a doctor who said, yeah, sure, it's, it's great that Jerry's on the cross-country team. He can go right back to it. And um, my family supported that. My coach supported that. And and uh, just having that luck made a big difference in my life. And I, I look around the room, and I know that you are all making other people that lucky now, and that's terrific. Um, the second thing, of course, was finding other people that were going through what I was going through and, and trying to be athletically active. Um, you know, um, I. Since I started running long ago, I, I always thought this was this was the thing for me. I I, I enjoy it so much, and um, it's good for me. And and uh, I love being out there and doing it, and and finding other people who are figuring out how how to do that with diabetes has been uh, a, a major help to me. And the third thing I would say is. Uh, 
I just noticed my wife made it back here. Uh, um, the third thing I would say is not taking no for an answer when, when you do get those negative um, messages from people, but figuring out how you can make it work. There are people doing it, and uh, if, if you don't see anybody, anyone else doing it, it doesn't mean it can't be done. What, what advice would you give someone newly diagnosed with diabetes today? Uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, your relationship to medicine has totally changed. And um, no offense to a great diabetes-focused um, doctor, but you're, when you're diagnosed, you are your own doctor. You're the person that, that is most concerned and uh, needs to know the most about your condition and what you're going to do about it. Take control of your diabetes. Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Gee. I think you could do I, something with that. I think, uh, I, heard that, I, think I heard that phrase before. <laughs> do you want to have a good call? Sure. Phrase? <laughs> well, um, I would say this. Uh, any of the, even if it's past your, your little turn, you, you're welcome to jump in when other people make comments, too, because you, you may have remembered things. Well, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Carlson. I think he needs very little introduction. Uh, Bill got diabetes when he was 16 in 1977, again in the dark ages. Uh, and, you know, Bill, I think reading a little bit about you, it sounded like you had a really good coach in high school that just said, listen, keep exercising and do what you're doing, and a little bit like your story. And Bill has gone on to really, I think, is one of the forefronts of putting type 1 diabetics on the professional map. And he always did seven, you know, Ironmans and, you know, like, I, there's too many to count here, but 150 triathlons. I mean, he does them like every week, 75 marathons and three, three of these 100-mile grueling races, you know, 50, over 50, 50-mile 50 races, and he's still super active. So Bill asked me to help with his diabetes, and of course, Bill doesn't need any help pretty much, like, other than fill, refilling his prescriptions. Um, he, he came down to see me, and his A1C is better than mine. He, has, he had much less hypoglycemia. He's in way better shape. And I told him during our meeting that I had this pain in my leg when I hiked. And he, he, he got me on the examining table, and he's like doing all these things to me and telling me my exercises. Then my nurse comes in, and he's on top of me rubbing my leg. I go, that was pretty embarrassing. Easy. So, uh, Bill, how, how, tell us uh, what are the top three things that's really helped you survive, and what would you suggest to someone newly diagnosed, and what kind of technology has helped you the greatest? Um, the top three things that uh, uh, when, when, I first, when I first got my diabetes, um, I already had a plan that I, of, of athletic activities that I wanted to do. And I, I saw myself lose 20 pounds in a couple of weeks. And I had the polydipsia, polyuria, you know, all these poly problems. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I really just, I, I asked my uh, doctor at the time for the advice that, you know, what was it that I had to do because I had to get back and, and do what I wanted to do, what was on my game plan. And I think that that's important for the person with diabetes. And, and of course, that was easy for myself because um, I, I open with an open mind like a lot of expressives are. They look at the challenge and say, okay, give me the challenge, let me manage it, manage it, and let me get on to the next activity. And so that's what I did. So I just, uh, I needed some time to learn what my activities were that I, I needed to be as successful as I could with managing my diabetes, and I did that. So, so, I, so one of the things that I've always done is try to keep the, the, the most open mind as I could and try all these new activities. Although the thing that I just cannot get over is that you know, when you get out of the swim for a 2.4 mile swim and then give yourself eight units of Humalog right in the thigh. I don't know if I can do that. That's just too scary. <laughs> you have to talk to Clifford about that one. But, um, but keep an open mind about uh, other ways that you can manage it and try these other methods because you'll eventually find something that's going to work for yourself 
to be successful, as successful as you possibly can be. Um, and then having the desire to achieve, try to keep something on, on the schedule. I've, I've always done that, and trying to keep another uh, 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 physical activity, uh, uh, a, a race or something like that, on my calendar so that I can continue to pursue. You might not make that race because some other activity comes up or something, but at least you've got something to shoot for. And as we've all learned, exercise is such a key component to controlling the diabetes. So why not? Why not do that? And then, and then you, and you just have to have the guts to try it, to try some crazy things. I've been doing a lot more uh, specific bike racing in the last, the last five years, and. I go through my, my normal uh, uh, daily amount of insulin that I take is about 32 units. By 10.30 in the morning, I am already through 32 units of insulin because of what uh, the, the, met, uh, the metab metabolic needs are for bike racing. So it's, it's very challenging, and it's pretty scary taking that much insulin, but it works. It works. Um, the, the talk that you gave this morning was absolutely incredible, and I can't wait to you know, get closer to that type of situation. That's, you know, these new advances. You know, uh, the, the Dexcom has been uh, an in, incredible uh, uh, device that I've used. So all these new uh, technologies and uh, advancements that we have through science is, uh, are absolutely things to, to try. I'm not, I haven't tried Similin yet, but maybe we can, <laughs> you know. Because this was a sedentary morning for me. My blood sugar shot up way too high, and I took more insulin, you know, for a normal breakfast, but for some reason it's too high, so I'd like to try that. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> no. Okay. But an and, and information that I have for the person that's uh, newly diagnosed, my, my advice to you is this. Listen, 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 and learn and try to get as many of those tools as you can. And then if you have any questions, you need to go into Medscape or Medline and, and learn about the physiology, what happens with your body. And then with all the technology that we have with all the different types of pumps uh, uh, and uh, uh, blood glucose monitoring systems where you can plug all that information in, I had to uh, write all this information down, you know, volumes and volumes of self-documentation to to achieve some of these athletic events when I was younger. And, and now it's all digitized. And easily you can drop these, all these graphs and everything. It, it, it's so much easier now. But that stuff really will bring you up to speed on, on how to get the management just perfect. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Bill. You know, it's, it's funny, as I, I'm going to introduce our next, our next and final panelist, but I, I, I was, if I tried to summarize what you just told us, it would be um, learn as much as you can. Be as thoughtful as you can with the data that you have, and try something crazy on a regular basis. <laughs> and I love how you, I love the, com the potential combination of that. Um, so let me introduce Judith. This is our, our fourth panelist. Uh, Judith Ambrosini's had type 1 diabetes since 1962. Uh, she claims that diabetes has guided her down many winding roads and pathways. I bet that's true for many of you. Uh, as a distance walker, she's completed international marathons and takes part in an annual 32-mile walk around Manhattan Island. Hope that's not at night, could be dangerous. Um, she is a dedicated <laughs> proponent and practitioner of daily exercise, including dance, and if you were around earlier today, Tai Chi, um, and cycling. She's currently a diabetes journalist, and she covers exercise and healthy cooking and how it relates to the good life with diabetes. And you should know she's completed her first book of inspiring life stories of women athletes with diabetes. Perhaps, hopefully, some of them are here. And that's going to be available in this coming March. So Judith, what do you think about the questions that were uh, put forward? Uh, well, first of all, I feel like a slug compared to <laughs> my fellow uh, panel members who have achieved such great, great uh, accomplishments with, with their sports. Um, uh, and thank you for asking me to be on the panel. Uh, I thought about the questions a little bit, and I think that the other three have answered um, the questions very, very thoroughly and with great uh, uh, graciousness. Uh, but I would say, I, I think, I remember back, I think it was 19, 
88 uh, where I, start, I started getting involved with the American Diabetes Association, and it was the triangle of care. It was insulin, exercise, and diet. And I immediately thought, well, what about attitude? And I always put a circle around that triangle. And I think the most important thing is to have a great and a positive attitude about living with diabetes because it will take you, you know, up to climb to the top of the mountain and to finish the, the ultra marathons and the triathlons, whatever else you're doing. Um, and I think the other thing is uh, support of family and friends and those close to you. Uh, and here, our diabetes community of all being together, uh, which is absolutely glorious to be part of and see everyone. And uh, it's a whole new, uh, a whole new uh, chapter in the book. Um, and what was the other one? I had three. Uh, oh, what would you tell someone who is newly diagnosed with you're diabetes? You're allowed to look at your notes. Am I, I, yeah, I don't have my reading glasses on. <laughs> Let me see if I can do it without. Okay. Uh, bum, 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 bum. I had a third one here. Uh, the diabetes community. And the, the, for the first question, it's belief in yourself and reaching for dreams and accomplishing them, as I think everyone in this room has done. And that's a very important part. As far as being newly diagnosed, uh, to educate yourself about diabetes, about your own body, and as Bill said, to be your own physician. No offense over here. Uh, um, and to, to find support, to reach out to groups like this, to the uh, other organizations, and to find camaraderie and friendship, because you're not alone. As years and years ago, back in Jurassic Park days of diabetes, we were alone. We didn't know anybody else who had diabetes and now we all have each other. So that's, I think, very important to reach out. Um, let's see. And, and technology. Uh, well, the technology, again, back in the days where we sharpened our 23-gauge stainless steel needles with whetstones and we had our uh, ADA exchange list scotch taped on cabinets. I mean, we've come to, uh, smart pumps and all of the technology that we've been talking about over the last few days. Uh, the one thing I uh, thought to say is one of, the, uh, one of the young women in my book, her name is Elise Zivitz, and she's a, a great all-around athlete, and she compares living with diabetes to driving a, a great um, a manual transmission car. And she said that uh, you have more control more responsibility, but you're in the driver's seat just like all of the best sports cars. So um, I think that we're all in that driver's seat. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to say that, you know, two people are worried about offending me uh, as being a doctor, but, uh, you know, one of the reasons I started TCOID is to, you know, you live with diabetes 24 7, and, you know, even at best, you're going to see your doctor every three months for a few minutes. And so I think, you know, I, I really appreciate everybody's comments. You know, diabetes is an individual con condition. What, wor what works for you may not work for someone else. So it's all about education and uh, getting smart, and trial and error, doing things crazy. But, uh, you know, certainly not holding back on doing anything you'd like to do in life uh, from diabetes. And I, I've always thought, I've always told many of my patients that exercise, you know, is so important. But exercise screws up your diabetes. If I could sit home and eat the 24 daily re caloric requirements divided equally every hour, just sit there and not do any exercise, uh, my blood sugars would be awesome. But exercise can really mess up your diabetes. And I, so it's really nice to see how people can take it and deal with it. And everyone gets their own little tools and tricks how to keep their blood sugars in a zone. And then uh, if Steve, and Ed can get off their butts and work faster, we could, uh, we, we wouldn't have to worry about it as much. Bill? And, well, and just, you know, you circled attitude and so much of the stuff that Bill does at BDI, is, it's really attitude and, and it's so important. And it's, how do you get someone that doesn't have a good attitude? Uh, and I think groups like this, getting around people who could be supportive, but not in a brow beating sort of way is, is the way to go. You know, it's nice for me being here is, 
again, I, uh, I have a funny career. I only meet people who are having a tough time managing their diabetes. So anytime I actually get to meet someone who, who's actually managing diabetes well, I'm always kind of shocked. So it's part of the reason I love coming to these meetings to remember what, what the potential real world can be like. And when people go through what we call diabetes burnout, it's almost always about feeling that diabetes is out of your control. People feel powerless in the face of diabetes. And I think everyone goes through moments of that. But what I think is wonderful about our panelists here is they've all found ways to say, no, I'm going to be in charge of this disease. I'm going to take control. If Steve, you don't mind me saying take control. I know you trademarked me saying that out loud. <laughs> I have to pay him a nickel every time I say it. Um, <laughs> but how wonderful that is. So I, I just would love to open up, we want to ask you your questions and answers, but I just would love to hear more from our panelists about other thoughts they have about, um, but I think I counted up, we have 210 years of diabetes experience sitting at this table right here. Um, other comments about things that you found useful that helped you to keep going? Please, Bill, or anything. I, w I was not a, a diabetes camper, and my son was diagnosed with diabetes, let me see, how long? Seven years ago now. Clayton, and he's, he's a 16-year-old, he's a rough-and-tumble guy, you know, he likes to ride his BMX bike and stuff, and he thinks these uh, diabetes camps are goofy. Now, every time I go to a, a diabetes event, you know, where I'm with, you know, more than, you know, one other diabetic, I call it diabetes camp, because you have this uh, congeniality, this, there's, there's some social mores that just absolutely drop when you get to an event with all these people that are, they have the same condition which can drop you like that. It yeah. could. Yeah. But because of that, and we share this thing, thing in common, we have this social connection which is just unlike any other. Yeah. And, and because of that, it is so valuable. And that's why this group is so successful. So I encourage you all, you know, Try to do this more than once a year, because it's really a good thing for you psychologically, which is, which is what you do. Yeah, regular diabetes camps for adults. <laughs> what else? Other things from our panelists? A anybody Anybody in the audience is ah, welcome please. to ask a question or yeah. tell Questions, an experience. Comments? Please chime in. Just yeah. say it real loud. Steve. Well, Steve, we have, to, we have to make the definition of type 3, type 4, because according to my definition, type 3 is you be a, your, you know, your daughter, your significant other, anybody that's related to you would be a type 3. But let's just say you got divorced, your wife would now be a type 4 if you're divorced. So. <laughs> Please, Judith. Say something. Uh, speaking about camps, Paula and I uh, went to a... Uh, a women's retreat camp spa this uh, June, uh, upstate New York on an organic farm, and it was all women with diabetes. It was a small group, but we did, we did hiking, we did yoga, we did learn meditation, we had uh, talking circles, and it was quite unique uh, and something put together by three women with diabetes. So uh, 
if anyone has the inkling to have their own adult, you know, boys or girls retreat camps, uh, you can do it. Us guys don't need to have our guys only retreat. <laughs> it's only the women that seem to do that. Yeah, in the back. God, you deserve a medal to put up with him. Oh my God. You know, um, w w when you come to these conferences, you, you get the impression that everybody up here around has perfect A1C control, and uh, you should have Clayton hang out with me, and he'll feel much better about himself. Uh, <laughs> and you know what? It's not easy, and uh, I'm sure, you know, Bill has his ups and downs. We all do, and I, I would bet that more people in this room have a higher A1C than a lower A1C, and it's just because we don't have the technology, we have a lot of other uh, th obstacles that we have to deal with, but yeah, you can get the feeling that you're not, everyone's perfect around you, but you're not, but certainly I think we're all in the same boat, uh, and some people, at least in my experience of my personal and being an endocrinologist, that some people work super hard and they just have a harder time reaching their goals than others. And there's a lot of variables that are involved. So um, I can certainly empathize with Clayton, too, being with Mr. Perfect, you know, his dad. Um. But if you want to put extra pressure on Clayton, we could, since he, you're here, we, why don't we all just go to your home after this? We'll just <laughs> come with you and say hi. Get too to much do. barbecuing I'll have to do. <laughs> Other, what else? Questions, comments from anyone, please, or our panelists? Oh. Hi. Excellent. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Scoring girls with diabetes. <laughs> wow, I love it. 
Peter, you want to come on up and mosey on up because I'm sure you want to say, it's getting close to the end, I want, I'm sure you want to say goodbye to everybody while we make a few more comments. You guys, I can't believe how many people are still here at the end of the conference on Sunday. Uh, that's that's would, impressive. But Jerry, please. I would just like to say that I do visit the, uh, the behavioral diabetes website frequently and read things on there. I don't want anybody to get the impression that I haven't experienced burnout and terrifying events uh, related to diabetes. And I don't. When I, certainly anybody that knows me doesn't have the impression that I, I don't slide as an athlete. So, um, yeah, we, we're going to not be perfect all the time, but we, the, the thing is to keep trying. It, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, you know that? <laughs> yes, Brandon. <laughs> yeah. Please. Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, because of all the work we're doing with guiding the technology, I've worn CDM for long periods of time. And for people without diabetes, our blood sugars don't stay at you know, 70 to 120. I mean, I'll eat a big dessert and I'll hit 200. Um, yeah, and I'll drop down into the low 60s and high 50s. Uh, so I, I think people with diabetes are often preparing themselves for Maybe in 2017, but not till then. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's true. A lot of these uh, organizations like uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, they say your postprandial should be less than 140. You know, it's just, it's just not realistic at all. And uh, so, yeah, that's a good point, Steve. Okay. Well, thank you all. Appreciate where's, it. Where's Peter? Peter, go for it. Come on, Peter. Well, thank you all. Um, you've you, you've been carrying around this cup. It, yeah. it smells like vodka. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Bill and Steve, for for agreeing to come, being such tremendous support of insulin dependence. It really does mean a lot to us. So, um, we're going to close things off. Uh, we welcome people to continue the dialogue as you're making your way home. Uh, we hope to see you again. And uh, thanks for an outstanding event. Okay.